proximal convoluted tubule cells have some microvilli to increase the surface area. That's why they absorb there, okay? Absorb the salt in water. In PCT, proximal convoluted tubule returns most molecules in H2O from filtrate back to peritubular capillaries. So first, reabsorption is return of molecules and water from the period, uh, from the tubules into blood vessel, into interstitial space. In the proximal tubule, you reabsorb. We reabsorb almost 65% of the filtrate. So let's see if our kidney has filtered 100 ml blood or filtrate in X amount of time, 65 ml will be taken back by it passes through the proximal convoluted tubule, okay? So about 100, 180 liter per day of ultrafiltrated produced. So our glomerulus filter 180 liter per day, but only one to two liter of urine is excreted in 24 hours. That means almost 99% of whatever your kidney filter, whatever your nephron filter, whatever your glomerulus filter, everything is taken back, okay? Urine volume varies according to needs of body. And sometimes we pass as more urine, sometimes we less, based on what is the amount of water you drink or liquid you drink and what is the use of the body. But to maintain your physiological function of all organs and tissue in the body, your body must excrete certain amount of urine to excrete metabolic waste from your body. And that is called obligatory water loss. So that minimum of 400 ml per day urine is necessary to excrete metabolic waste. And that's why we call it obligatory water loss. That means this is obligation for us to excrete at least 400 ml per day. So that whatever waste product has produced in our body can be easily excreted, okay? So here you go. In the simple diagram, we have a glomerulus here, afferent arteriole, efferent arteriole, so due to increased pressure and the need filtration pressure with other content of the blood, some molecules, not a cell, and water is filtered and that is called filtration. So here is filtration going on. Once filtration passes, filtrate passes into the Bowman's capsule here in the Bowman's space then it goes to proximal convoluted tubule here. This is the main location where reabsorption takes place. So here is the transport of molecules out of this tubular fluid from here outside back into the interstitial space and then nearby blood that is called reabsorption, okay? So first what happens? In this wall, let's see. <clears throat> In this wall, we have cells here, yes? We have cell here. And this cell has two surface. This area, inner area surface towards the lumen is called basal surface, basal surface. And outside, which is facing outside towards the interstitium, it's called basolateral surface. So when filters comes here, filtrate, these filtrate here first, pass through this plasma membrane, get inside the cell, then through the basolateral mem membrane, it comes into here in the interstitial space, which is outside the cell. And then through there, it passes through the endothelial cells, which is the wall of blood vessel. And then it enters the blood vessels and mix with blood. Are you following me? That is reabsorption, okay? So, <sighs> 
when uh, these solid particles, they are transported by the carrier with the use of energy, whereas water just follow them due to, because if we take solid particles from here and put it into the interstitium, interstitial space, we are increasing the concentration in that area. That's why water by osmosis follows these molecules. And that's why water is never transported actively. Other molecules are transported and water follows by osmosis, okay? So let's see how main sodium, chloride, potassium, these things are absorbed. So I'm gonna talk about absorption of here. In this diagram, there is sodium only. So there is absorption of absorption of sodium potassium not so potassium glucose protein or amino acid uh, chloride So let's say hydrogen ion, how they are excreted and produced here, uh, absorbed here. So here, this is the lumen of kidney tubules, proximal tubules inside a space here. And this is the wall cell. We can see here two cells. One cell here, this is the enfolding, that is the villus. And then you know the cell, and then this is spaces. This space in the middle is paracellular space. Okay. So let's see first how sodium is transported in your proximal tubule. So in the vasolateral membrane, there is a protein molecule in the plasma membrane of these tubular cells. This is called sodium potassium transporter. Okay, this is called sodium potassium pump or transporter. So using ATP, when you use ATP, you transport certain things against the gradient. If you remember our osmosis lab, if one side is high concentration and other side is low concentration, the solid particle will move to the lower concentration side. That is called simple diffusion. And for that, there is no need of energy. But if I have to move from lower concentration to the higher con concentration, then I need energy, which comes from ATP. So that's what happens here. These, the membrane protein transporter use ATP, you see, using ATP, breaks down in ADP, energy is formed, and with that energy, they transport sodium against their gradient from lower to higher in the interstitium. And once in the interstitium it is high, by diffusion then it enters into the nearby blood vessel. So what this uh, pump do, this is a sodium potassium pump. So they bring sodium out and takes potassium in because they maintain the electrolytes, positive ions both side, okay? So potassium is getting inside, and sodium is coming outside. Now with this pump, what is this pump doing now there? This pump is creating low sodium here and high potassium here. Yes, this is doing low sodium and high potassium. Now, <clears throat> Let's see, so that is sodium is coming out, but we have not talked about how sodium coming from the lumen. So due to low concentration of sodium here now, sodium, which is high concentration in the lumen is transported through the co-transport. This is secondary active transport because this is not requiring energy. 
So it coupled with glucose and then it comes outside this channel, sodium here. Sometimes it also binds with amino acid and then comes inside. And then this sodium then slowly comes outside through the exit. Glucose then by facilitate diffusion because glucose concentration is also high. So due to facilitate diffusion through the channel, glucose also comes outside in the interstitium and then in the blood vessel. So from the kidney, if there is glucose, do you remember? Like if you have glucose up to 70 to 100 milligram per deciliter in your blood, uh, it will not filter glucose. Your, it will come through the efferent artery and go to efferent. It will not filter, but if it is more than 110, then uh, it will filter here in the glomerulus and then they are reabsorbed here back into your blood. But how long till this carrying capacity of this co-transporter, glucose transporters are not saturated, which is 200 milligram per deciliter. Once your blood is 200 milligram per deciliter, this system cannot handle. And then urine through the urine, your sugar will pass, okay? So that is the one way. So you are adding sodium here. Now you have more sodium inside the interstitial space. So to maintain, because it is positive ion here but a lot, so to maintain electro, uh, electrical neutrality between these surface of the cells, which is called paracellular space, chloride ion will move here, chloride. And so sodium moved, chloride moved, and that increased concentration here. Now what happens if there is more concentration than water by diffusion, sorry, by osmosis, water will easily move. Okay, now this potassium will increase here. So what does this potassium do? Potassium, then uh, to maintain this potassium, hydrogen potassium pump is another pump here. So hydrogen comes outside uh, and then potassium come inside here. Same transport of sodium, uh, hydrogen and potassium. Okay, so this is, The, the take home message summary is here. Here is active and then everything is from there passive. This is the pump which maintains sodium here and then everything follows after that. Uh, so Dr. Cha, just to clarify really fast, um, the sodium is coming in and it's just basically kind of like going out again? Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Going out means going out of the cell in the interstitial space. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so here, the same uh, diagram I'm talking again. So this is filtration and then sodium is transported actively and then chloride through the paracellular space passively follows it and glucose and uh, amino acid is also transported, coupled with sodium. And then once there is more sodium and chloride in the interstitium that increase osmolality, and then water follows salt by simple osmosis. So by the time your filtrate passes up to the proximal convoluted tubule, fluid is reduced to one third original volume, but it's still isotonic to your plasma. That means it's still, this fluid has osmolality of around 300 milliosmoles. Why is that? Because the amount of sodium chloride ion absorb follows the similar amount of water also. That's why the osmolality is not changed. Okay, so here is some stat of significance of proximal convoluted tubule reabsorption. Approximately 60, approximately 65% of sodium chloride in H2 is reabsorbed in proximal convoluted tubule, and that is returned to your bloodstream. 
Are you following me? An additional 20% is reabsorbed in descending loop of Henley. So 65 plus 25, that is 85%. But the mechanism in the loop, we are gonna talk about that later, is different than the PCT. Thus, 85% of filtered, filtered H2A and salt are reabsorbed early in tubules. And this mechanism is constant. Doesn't matter how much party you had and how much alcohol you have drunk, beer you have drank, and how much water you have drunk or you, how long you are dehydrated. No matter what you filter, 85% of filtrate should must go inside your blood vessel by the end of loop, okay? This is constant and independent of hydration level. And to do this, you need energy. So energy cost is 6% of calories consumed at rest. Let me ask you, why you need 6% energy for the reabsorption? Sodium potassium pump? Yes, sodium potassium pump are active pump and they break down ATP. 6% of your calories, like if you are taking 20,000, that is 2,000, that means that is almost 120 calories. 120 calories is around a large size banana. So just to make your pee, you need to eat one banana. That's much energy you would need for this one. The remaining 50% is reabsorbed variably depending on level of hydration. So here you go. Now after loop in the collecting duct and DCT, role of the hormone plays how much you're gonna reabsorb. If you are hydrated, you reabsorb more, sorry, less. If you are dehydrated, then you reabsorb more so your blood volume is maintained. And that works with the hormone. So that's why when you are rehydrated, when you are dehydrated, the amount of aldosterone and the ADH released from your body are different. Are you following me? Okay, so in order to H2 to be reabsorbed, interstitial fluid must be hypertonic. Yeah, we did that from the proximal tubule. We put sodium outside and that increased the osmolality of interstitial fluid. Okay, so let's see how that happens. If you take the diagram of kidney here. So let's see if this is the kidney model here. And if you see this, can you see kidney model here? So if you see the cortex and the medulla, this is the glomerulus here in the cortex. And these are the tubules. So if fluid enters these tubules and it enters down, if you start from the cortex to the medulla, cortex region of the kidney or the nephron, is hypoosmolar, means osmolality is less. They are like osmolality of our plasma, which is 300 milliosmol. By the time you go deepest area in the medulla, it is highly concentrated. And that is like around 1200 to 1400 milliosmol. So how from in this small, tiny, or again, osmolality change from here to here because it has a loop and loop has that property. PCT has some property, what's the main property is loop because PCT, do you remember? Once it get out of the PT, proximal convoluted tubule, there is no change in osmolality. They are still isotonic. So this is loop which plays role making medullary region of the kidney hyper or smaller. And why? We're gonna see that later, okay? So a smolality of medullary interstitial fluid is 1200 to 1400 milliosmol, which is four times that of cortex and plasma, 
which is 300 milliosmol plasma osmolality. Uh, we talked about it in last time that is like 295, so approximately it is 300 milliosmoles. This concentration gradient results from largely from loop of Henle, which allows interaction, interaction between descending and ascending limbs. So let's see here. Before we talk about ascending and descending loop, so here, this is the starting point of loop. Before here, it is proximal tubule. So once fluid is coming from the proximal tubule in the cortex, it is still 300 milliosmoles. Okay. Now medulla start from here. Before we talk about how this change from 300 to 1400, let's see the characteristic of descending limb and ascending limb here. Descending limb, descending limb is passively permeable to water. That means water can enter and exit this descending limb. Okay, that's the permeability of the descending limb. Whereas ascending limb, particularly the thick ascending limb, are impermeable to water. Water cannot get in or out of this area. But there is a lot of channels. You see X, those are the active channels. When you see the X, there means active process going on there. They are active transport of sodium chloride. So there is pump sodium and sodium pump. And that pump can easily transport the sodium outside of these tubules. Okay. So ascending limb, first ascending limb here. Has thin segment. You see, this is the thin segment. Has thin segment in the depth of medulla and thick part towards the cortex. And they are impermeable to water, permeable to salt. Thick part actively transport salt out of filtrate, this part. So it transport sodium chloride here outside. Active transport of salt causes filtrate to become dilute. So what happens? We are sending here 300 milliosmoles. And because this is permeable to water, if outside is hyperosmolar, then what happens? Water is moving outside. So if you move more water from this 300, then it becomes 600. More water out, 800 milliosmoles. More water out, 1,000 milliosmoles, more water out, 12, 1,400. And then once it reaches the thick limb, that means you are sending very concentrated fluid inside the thick ascending limb. So now there are active pump, they are pumping sodium outside of these tubules into the interstitium. And if you put interstitium here, then what happens? you are increasing the concentration of sodium around the descending limb. If you put more sodium, that means you are increasing more osmolality. That means you will draw more water from the tubules and more water will then enter the capillary tube. So what is going on? The action of ascending limb an action of descending limb is helping each other or opposing each other? Helping. Helping each other. Yes, so if one helps other, that is positive feedback mechanism or negative feedback mechanism? Positive. positive. So this is here, you can see positive feedback mechanism. And we call this mechanism counter current multiplier system. Why? Their current is opposite direction downward, upward, towards the medulla, towards the cortex. So they are counter current, but what are they doing? They are multiplying the concentration inside and outside. Ascending thick limb is multiplying concentration in the interstitium, whereas descending limb is multiplying concentration in the inside the tubule, in the ascending limb. 
Are you following me? That's why we call it counter current multiplier system. So by the time it exit out of the ascending limb, you see again, it reaches like isotonic, but later we have, by the time it reaches the distal convoluted tubule, you see, and collecting duct, you see there is hypo or smaller, hypotonic compared to interstitium or your blood, okay? So this is called countercurrent multiplier system. So extrusion of sodium chloride from ascending limb makes surrounding interstitial field more concentrated and multiplication of concentration due to descending limb passively permeable to water, causing fluid move out of the tubule as the surrounding interstitial fluid is more concentrated here. And that's why deepest region of the medulla is around 1400 milli osmols. Okay, and this is a positive feedback mechanism. Okay, and this is the countercurrent exchange in vasa recta. So nearby blood vessels, nearby the loop of Helni, you see, uh, the blood flow, so when it is going towards the medulla, you can see the blue arrows, that movement of water is coming outside. And then in the interstitium, then urea is also transporting here, sodium and urea. Okay. So now the distal convoluted tubule does the same mechanism what we have seen in the proximal, and but they have very little function about the reabsorption, around like eight to ten percent only. The main function now in the collecting duct. So collecting duct. <coughs> let's see the diagram. Collecting duct is here. So collecting duct, if you see here, three hundred. 100 by DCT, this is 100. And 100 milliosmoles you are trans transporting to the collecting duct, an early part of DCT. So what does it do? We will come here back again. Collecting duct main role is to absorb water because the hormone, antidiuretic hormone, puts aquaporin in the plasma membrane of collecting duct cells. And then aquaporin channels takes water outside the tubules, uh, the, the tubules and put in your body, okay? So collecting duct plays role in water conservation. That means when you are thirsty, dehydrated, that's the times ADH is a lot released and it is not letting you pee more. That's why we call them anti-diuresis means urination hormone, okay? Is permeable, is impermeable to, to salt in medulla. So there is no permeability to salt, okay? But permeability to H2O depends on the level of HD, uh, ADH. So what stimulates the secretion of ADH? Antidiuretic hormone secretion. So let's see one, go over this slide first. So like here, osmolality, and then go this way and breathe it. Let's see first one. When you are dehydrated, like you have not drank water for nine hours, that means your plasma volume is reduced. That's why you have increased osmolality of your plasma. That is sensed by your osmoreceptor in the hypothalamus. And then hypothalamus sends motor neuron to the, where? Posterior pituitary and those motor neurons, those neurons of the hypothalamus secrete antidiuretic hormone and store in the posterior pituitary from where it is released. And once it is released, effect on urine volume, what does it do? It decreases the urine volume because it 
puts the aquaporin channels in the wall and take out water from the collecting duct. If that happens, then what happens? You have increased water retention, decreased blood osmolality, and decreased amount of urine passing. Good. Same thing if you have reduced osmolality, just opposite happens, increased volume, decreased volume, and you can see how they decrease this antidiuretic or increased antidiuretic hormone. Okay. So let's see here. Low water intake and you have dehydration that increase your plasma osmolality because you are keeping the same solid particle in your blood, but your volume is low. Or you have high water intake. So let's go first low intake. We explained earlier. Osmoreceptor in hypothalamus, release antidiuretic hormone sent to posterior pituitary, then it released from there. Increase antidiuretic hormone on kidney, increase water reabsorption from collecting duct, less water excreted in urine, and then it gives negative feedback and this is turn off. And if needed, again, turn on. And that is the homeostasis of water. If you have high water intake or overhydration, your osmolality is reduced. And then the hypothalamus makes less ADH, less water re reabsorption, more water is excreted in urine, and then again, it gives negative feedback, okay? So that's how is collecting duct playing role in maintaining water plasma volume? So you see, in the collecting duct, you have 100 milliosmoles you are taking water out, 300, more water out, 400, more water out, 600, more water out, 800, 1200, 1500. So, it is passing now, okay? Okay. The third function of the function is secretion. So secretion is opposite of reabsorption. Once the fluid and other solid particles filtered, reabsorbed, but certain particle will not be filtered here. So they come through the efferent arteriole and exit through the efferent. And then when it comes here, in this area, it becomes capillaries around here. blood capillaries. So the component which was in this blood capillaries, like urea, we don't need it, or creatinine, we don't need it. The body doesn't need that. So this blood vessel wall then, this uh, the, the kidney tubules, through the active process again, using ATP, transport this solid particle back into the tubules, and that is secretion. And through this process, there is like hydrogen potassium secretion. So earlier, if you go back and check the previous slide where we were putting potassium inside the cell and then we want to uh, excrete the so, uh, hydrogen ion. So you can excrete hydrogen ion or if there is urea, you can transport urea back into these tubules and that is called secretion. So if I calculate whatever excretion is, that is the amount of urine. So excretion will be filtration plus secretion minus reabsorption. That's the equation will be, okay?
So excretion rate is equal to filtration rate plus secretion rate minus reabsorption rate. Got it? In the exam, if I put this equation and if I mismatch or scramble it here and there, you need to understand the concept. So what amount of urine you're gonna excrete is this equation. Glucose and amino acid reabsorption, we talked about all, uh, earlier. Filtered glucose and amino acids are normally 100% reabsorbed from filtrate. Occurs in proximal tubule by carrier mediated co-transport with sodium. We talked about it. Transporter displayed saturation if ligand concentration in filtrate is too high. Let's see, I'm gonna bring that again. So let's see uh, our blood glucose normal level. What is our blood glucose normal concentration, blood sugar? 80 to 100. 70 to 100 milligram per deciliter per 100 ml. So if we are in that normal value, our, the glomerulus will not filter the sugar. If filtered, they will be reabsorbed completely. If it is more than 110, 120, 130, it will be filtered and then reabsorbed, coupled with sodium. But you know there was sodium potassium co-transporter on the base, uh, basal surface of the tubular cells. So let's see, whatever is filtered up to 40 is reabsorbed, 60 reabsorbed, 180 reabsorbed, 200 reabsorbed. But more, once it is more than 180 or 200, at that time, most of the co-transporter, sodium potassium co-transporters are saturated. There is no trucks to load, no carrier. And then it is start leaking glucose in your urine because of saturation of the glucose transporter, glucose sodium, glucose transporter, co-transporter. And that is the carrier saturation which is called transport maximum. So level needed to saturate carrier and achieve maximum transport, transport rate is transport maximum. So if you transport, if the concentration of your blood sugar increase the transport maximum, then it will, sugar will appear in your urine. And that happens in type two diabetes, uh, in the diabetes. Do you know why? In diabetes, your blood sugar is always high, whether you eat less or more, because there is no insulin or lack of the receptor function. And that's why you pass blood sugar, or the sugar into your urine, glycosuria, that is diabetes. But let's say if you're a normal individual and you eat five donuts at once, and after two hours you check your urine, you're gonna see sugar positive in your urine because you have already saturated transporter. But that doesn't mean you have diabetes. That's why the test for diabetes is fasting glucose. Random glucose does not give you any hint about the diabetes. Or even today, Nowadays we do HbA1c, C, glycosylate, uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, HbA1c. So that is like adding sugar molecules to your uh, hemoglobin. And that happens if your blood sugar is long time high in your body. And that gives you average measurement of concentration of glucose in your blood for last 90 days. That's why HbA1c is good indicator. 
And if you have more than 5.8, then you are considered pre-diabetic. If you have like 6.4, they're gonna treat you with metformin or other antidiuretic medicine. Glucose and amino acid transporters don't saturate under normal conditions, okay? So glycosuria is presence of glucose in urine. And that occurs when glucose is more than 180 to 200 milligram per 100 ml. And that is called plasma, renal plasma threshold. Glucose is normally absent because plasma levels stay below this value. And hyperglycemia has to exceed renal plasma threshold. Diabetes mellitus occurs when hyperglycemia result in glycosuria. So diabetes, when you say diabetes, it is mellitus. There is another disease called diabetes insipidus, which is not diabetes. That is deficiency of antidiuretic hormone, diabetes insipidus. Some of you, somebody can present on diabetes insipidus. That is interesting topic. Diabetes mellitus is very common disease, but diabetes insipidus will be interesting. Okay, so reabsorption and secretion of potassium. So once potassium is here, you see potassium is filtered and then in the cortical portion of collecting duct, they are here, it is reabsorbed all and some of them are secreted. So whatever is filtered, everything is reabsorbed. And let's see if you eat five bananas in three hours, then your potassium concentration is very high. In that case, still, this potassium will be coming here and absorbing, if they secrete more, or filter more, they will reabsorb more. But to take it out from the body, body will secrete and then excrete it. So potassium almost completely reabsorbed proximal tubule. Under aldosterone stimulation, secreted into cortical collecting duct. So it is the concentration of potassium in your body, which stimulates your adrenal gland to secrete aldosterone. And that aldosterone hormone acts on cortical portion of collecting duct and that helps in secretion of potassium. So under aldosterone is secreted into collecting duct, all potassium units form secretion rather than filtration. And aldosterone not only does this, aldosterone works on the sodium potassium pump. So they take sodium out and put the potassium inside. Okay. Now JGA, juxtaglomerular apparatus. This is the special group of cells in the kidney which maintains your blood pressure. So among millions of nephron, here is one nephron, glomerulus, glomerular capsule, PCT, loop, DCT. And when DCT or ascending limb here, when ascending limb is coming here in contact with the afferent and efferent arteriole in this area, the afferent arteriole, the wall of the afferent arteriole, cells modifies. And these cells are called granular cells. So in between them, there are some cells, they are granular cells. Similarly, the thick ascending limb wall, these cells also modify and they become macula densa. This macula densa sense how much sodium is coming here. This granular cell detects what is the pressure or what is the flow or volume of blood in the efferent arteriole. So if there is more volume, more blood, more stretch, 
this cell, granular cell, detect that. And then granular cell produce a hormone called renin. Okay, and we're gonna talk about that later. This wall detects sodium. So let's see, after detecting and producing renin, what they do. And together, these all cells, we call them JG cells, juxtaglomerular apparatus cells, okay? So JGA is a specialized region in each nephron where afferent arterial comes in contact with thick ascending limb of uh, luteinizing uh, loop of Helny. And this is activated by release of renin from granular cells within the afferent arterial. So if there is more flow, then what happens? Renin, once produced, renin converts angiotensin to angiotensin one. Renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin one. This is the hormone which, which is found in your lungs. Now angiotensin one, is converted to angiotensin II by angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. And ACE enzyme is also found in the lungs, okay? Angiotensin II stimulates this one, release of aldosterone from your adrenal cortex. So angiotensin, tensinogen, angiotensin one, angiotensin two. So what converts this angiotensinogen into angiotensin one? Renin. Renin. So, can add here, this is by renin. Okay. Now angiotensin one is converted into angiotensin two by? Yes. ACE. Angiotensin converting enzyme, and that enzyme comes from the lungs. The lungs. Angiotensin two. Then this one. What does it do? It activates your adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. And now, what does aldosterone do? Aldosterone activates the DCT collecting duct to absorb more water and more sodium and excrete potassium. And that's how it increase the volume. So rain it is released based on what is the volume of the blood and what is the stretch in the front arteriole. And that's why if somebody has uh, blood pressure. So why it is blood pressure? Like if you have rain in that means you will have more water, more sodium, and you have blood pressure. So let's see if I inhibit this enzyme. If I inhibit this enzyme, let's say crush this enzyme, what will happen? Your P you will not make angiotensin 2. If you don't make angiotensin 2, that means you will not make aldosterone. Yes? Yes. So this one work as the uh, Inhibitor of this ACE is a medication which is used in blood pressure. So let's see here for detail again. Come on. Here you go. So 
So let's see what, when you have low sodium. And if you have low sodium, what happens? Low sodium intake, low plasma and sodium concentration sensor by the hypothalamus, posterior pituitary will reduce ADH and then water reabsorption collecting duct is reduced. So you have more urine volume and you have reduced volume, vol blood volume and that will reduce your blood pressure ultimately. But if you have reduced blood volume, then if you want to increase your blood pressure, what do you have to do? If there is reduced pressure in your efferent arteriole, don't connect here. It can be due to this region or any other region. If you have reduced blood volume, that means that blood volume is detected by juxtaglomerular apparatus. Yeah, so the juxtaglomerular apparatus then of uh, the, the granular cells which start producing increased renin, increased aldosterone, adrenal cortex and increased aldosterone will cause increased sodium reabsorption in co uh, cortical collecting duct. And if you have sodium re uh, retention, then you, what do you do? You increase blood pressure. And that's how you're maintaining your blood pressure all the time. But let's see, due to any region, if you have increased blood volume or increased sodium retention, then you cause, if, if, if this path is high, then you have a blood pressure. So what do we do? From renin, what does renin do? It converts angiotensin, gen to angiotensin two. So we can, AC, in this area, we can block the AC. And once you block the AC, then you will reduce this path. That means you have less sodium retention and less fluid retention. And that's how you treat uh, the hypertension with AC inhibitors like lisinopril, lisinopril, there are several medication. Here is macula densa. So macula densa is uh, where the tubular cells make contact with the granular cells and acts as sensor for tubular glomerular feedback and they regulate your GFR. So signal separates arteriole to constrict when there is more water in the filtrates. So this one, ask this arteriole to increase or decrease the diameter based on what is the sodium concentration. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you guys. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you, Professor. Professor Shah. Uh-huh. Does- Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, is it possible for overhydration to lead to an, act an overactive bladder? Like are those two related concepts? Uh, if you have like overhydration, then you will pee more, but that is not like overactive. That's a normal physiology. Overactive mm -hmm. means with even with the less amount of urine, if your mm. bladder is acting more, that is overactive bladder. Oh, okay. okay. Can I have another question? Do It's not related to this, section, but it's related to like physiology. Do you have any theories on why the AstraZeneca vaccine causes blood clots in women that are under 60? I have no idea. We have to check oh, that. Mm -hmm. what, what is the reason? Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.